I have two different pitches. They're the same pitch from opposite directions whenever I'm talking to someone about what glider to buy. And I call them pitches because it's a salesmanship technique and I, I want to be very clear. If money is everything to you and your skills are good, now you don't know if your skills are good because you haven't been through training yet. First off, I highly recommend you buy a glider before you train. Highly recommend it. I highly recommend you watch our kiting DVD. I highly recommend you link up with an aviator ambassador, which will be available after the fall, to learn how to kite so you can go into training knowing what to do right. However, I generally recommend people not buy their equipment before they train because you don't know how good you're going to be. So I want to recommend that you buy a glider that is going to be good for everyone, which is the Mojo. If money is the number one priority to you, if you don't care as much about your safety, you don't care as much about having a safer progression, you don't care as much about having a progression that's going to keep you stable throughout the entire thing, you could buy a Roadster or a Spider. But if you want to be the best pilot you can be, a Mojo will make you that best pilot. It will enforce things in you. In nine months, 12 months, 18 months, you decide you want to start doing wingovers, doing it on a Mojo will make you be a baller pilot. It will force you to be a baller pilot because it will force you to utilize energy management that is far beyond any reflex wing. Far beyond. Doing any maneuver of substance or substance on a beginner wing is much more challenging. It requires you to be as perfect as possible. So, oh, John just dropped the throttle. That one's to be on sale, guys. Um, <laughs> So the Mojo is fantastic. The Roadster and Spider are great. The only reason I wouldn't buy a Spider over a Roadster is because you flew off the uh, like gravel. Uh, it's lighter fabric, but it God, it flies nice. So consider that for sure. Um, as you move forward and you start making a decision, you can contact your instructors in Midwest. Matt and Dave are incredibly talented, great people. They will serve your needs. I would definitely recommend if you have the capital to invest and, and money's not the highest priority to you, where you're willing to make an investment in your future, an investment into your safety, an investment into your pilot skill, buy a Mojo. Because while people say you'll outgrow it in six months, the reality is I still fly a Mojo more than every other glider, period. I fly a glider, the, the Mojo, every day I get to fly because if it's bumpy, if it's windy, if I'm flying in turbulent conditions or in crap conditions, I'm going to fly a wing that's going to keep me safe versus a wing that's going to put me on edge, period. All right. Uh, Will Lobb says, is a PPG-3 course on the horizon? Slightly down. Slightly down, Nina. Whoa. Uh, I have the PPG-2, but unfortunately did not get the memo about how good you guys and gals are. I would like to become an Aviator PPG alumni at some point for some kind of intermediate course. Will, you get to be the first to know. Officially, August the 4th, we're having a PPG-3. It's on the website? It's on the screen. It's on the screen. Boom. August the 4th, we're having a PPG-3, August 3rd, I've messed it up, August 3rd, PPG-3 class clinic. So if you guys already have a PPG-2, you'd like to accelerate your skills, prove what you know, learn what you don't, for 750 bucks, two days, you don't need to bring your equipment, just show up, although Will, you should fly your Mooney down for sure. Um, we will help you. There are six slots available right now. It's on the website, avitorppg.com. Uh, it's also on screen right now. You guys can find out more information on how you can get your PPG-3. We're also going to announce uh, a thermal clinic in mid-August and a trike transition class in October. Those are our first three <coughs> excuse me, intermediate trainings that, that we'll be trying to serve people with, and then we're going to announce more. If these fill up quickly and people are excited about them, we will announce more very, very soon. So, <coughs> excuse me. We have more questions coming in, guys. Lots and lots more. I'm gonna take a 30 second break to scarf a, uh, a taco because I have Taco Bell because Sarah's awesome. And uh, I appreciate your, all your questions. Please continue to add more in there. If you'd like to sign up for the PPG3 training, let us know, leave a comment down below. And again, we're gonna give away a power float at the end of this podcast. Please share it now, let us know you've shared and uh, we'll stay in touch with you guys about that soon. We're taking about a 30 second to minute break. I apologize, I have to breathe. And I'm gonna bring Alex Huff on right after this. still swallowing Whoa. that's what she said <laughs> <laughs> the uh the diablo sauce from taco bell it's real spicy yeah. it is that yeah that's why it's called diablo sauce i feel like i'm dying a little bit <laughs> i got nothing for that one guys this is alex huff alex welcome to the podcast it's a, a joy to finally have you here i feel like we keep missing podcast day by like 24 hours 
I guess so. <laughs> For those of you guys who don't know who Alex is, <clears throat> Alex is quite possibly the most accomplished self-trained pilot in the world. Disagree? Not accomplished in flight, but you you built more cool stuff than any any other self-trained pilot. Come on, you have to admit it. Uh, I I don't know. I'm just messing with you. So Alex and I met because we trained flight tests on how to fly paramotors. Flight test is a YouTube video or YouTube series, YouTube channel about RC par- RC flying. Right? They build foam board airplanes and they fly all over the place. They do. At the time, you used to work for a company called Ready Beat RC as one of their engineers. Yep. Your background's all in engineering. It is. And you designed an airplane called the Goblin. Yep. Which, what's the average flight time on a, a regular RC plane, like an electric RC plane? 10 to 15 minutes. What's the flight time on a Goblin? Hour plus. <laughs> and it looks like a tailless uh, Bell X1. Yeah, it looks like a football with wings. Yep. All right. So... You developed this airplane, which is insane, uh, and then you saw flight tests learn to fly. What I was did. your progress from that? What, what made you want to fly paramotors? I wanted to fly paramotors way before I ever even heard of flight test. Really? I, I've been wanting to fly paramotors since, I think, 2004. Uh, I saw, a, found a guy on the internet called, I think his name was Bruce Brown. I know Bruce Brown. Do you? I've never. I actually, I've only met Bruce Brown one time. It was a beach blast about five years ago. I've never met him, but at the time he ran a paramotor school in Finley, Ohio, and um, I really wanted to fly. And I read and researched everything I possibly could about paramotors. Thought it was the coolest thing in the world. But at the time, I was not very old. And I did not have very much money or uh, the means to pursue paramotoring. So what you're saying is not much has changed. Correct. (laughs) Um, So I really wanted to do it. I got very close. I talked to him on the phone. I talked to him about used gear because I didn't have any money. Um, I think that he wisely gave me the advice that, it wasn't the right time for me to do it. It's a really tough conversation to have. As an instructor, like as someone who runs a school, yeah. having to tell someone, like, listen, if you can't afford the classes, what are you going to do if you buy the gear and you break it? Like, why? Like, you want to come into this at the right time in your life. As much as you might be desperate for it, yep. it's a tough question. Like, no, I agree. No, he, he, <coughs> he obviously wanted to teach me to fly. He knew that I was passionate about it. Um, but I think he gave me the right advice. Um, and that, that it was just it was not possible for me to do it safely in the right way at that time. Um, what happened next? I forgot about it, to be honest. Uh, years went by, looked at it again. Pretty much the exact same thing happened again. I got even more serious about pulling the trigger on it. Um, still ended up not being the right time. Um, and forgot it about it again. Then and I went then. to then I went to college uh, <laughs> and got into all sorts of engineering stuff. And I've always enjoyed RC things uh, pretty much since forever. Um, and I the drone boom was just on the verge of happening, and I decided that I wanted to figure out what quadcopters were all about and nobody even knows what that means anymore it's all just drones <laughs> um, were you tri- quad or tricopters back then uh, qu- uh, quadcopters I bought one of the, <coughs> the very first ones that ever really existed and uh, subsequently crashed it and that's my experience with RC I, I started with it, one of the balsa wood airplanes my uncle bought it I gloriously flew it inside the side of our hangar and it was no more balsa wood it was more yeah, Twigs. yeah. I, I had had a bunch of RC planes, and that was always fun. But then I got a quadcopter, and it was, uh, it, it ended in pieces. But uh, I started buying so much stuff that uh, I developed a good relationship with uh, a guy named Tim Stanfield, who owns Ready Made RC. Um, and at the time, he offered me a job. 
turn it down because I had accepted a different position in engineering world. And uh, I don't know. We're kind of getting off track. But, but my, how far the mighty have fallen. You've gone from accepting jobs in the engineering world, from turning down jobs in the drone world, to taking jobs in the drone world, yep. to literally taking the RC community by storm. I think the Goblet is one of the highest selling RC planes on the market, isn't it? It's doing very well. It's He's kind of very the modest. Un, it is the it's the king of RC airplanes uh, in the in the electric world at least. And I want one. By they the way. are very fast and very high performance. And uh, it it was it was a lot of fun to work on that project. And I did a lot of other stuff with drones over the years. Um, and then somehow or another, I don't. I honestly can't say if it was Tucker or who it was, but somehow or another, Paramotors came back across my YouTube feed, and I said, you know what? I have the money, sort of. <laughs> and, I remember your first Paramotor. <laughs> and I, it was January, early January in Ohio, uh, which means it's snowing and well below freezing. Um, and... Despite everyone's advice, I found a guy on Craigslist and bought a used paramotor and wing off of him. You learned so well. I did. And uh, the wing was way too big for my weight. I was technically on paper within the weight range. Uh, Says the engineer who researched yep. it. Yep. <laughs> as far as I knew, I was in the weight range, so therefore I was good. And the motor was, it ran, um, <laughs> kind of, kind of. And I'm like, well, I design drones and airplanes, so obviously I know a lot about aerodynamics, so how hard could this be? And Not hurt at all. So six days after I bought my equipment, I went flying. And, and how did it end for you? Um, actually very well on the fifth flight on the, the first four <laughs> flights, the first four flights went pretty good. And I'm like, I got this whip. This is no big deal. So Alex was friends of my friends, right? So he, he's friends of my friends who we just taught to fly and he starts flying and we taught them in February. You flew around the same time. I don't, I'm not sure it was close to the same time. And I get this video. I think it was Alex Vada who sent it to me and Alex is like, Oh my God, Alex is trying to teach himself to fly. Watch this video. And I watched and I was just like, why? And then your fifth flight was not even as good as those. And everything broke. <laughs> and it was, it was, compl it, that was, that was when I realized that I didn't have it actually all, all figured out. Um, but I was like, this paramotoring thing is pretty cool. I think that I want to apply my engineering skills to this industry. So I decided to see who the big players are in the industry, to be honest. I, I want, I mean, if I'm an engineer and I'm gonna try and apply my skills to an industry, naturally the first place you're gonna look is to the top and try and find uh, who the big wheels are. Um, so, yeah, I found you on the Facebook, interwebs, yeah, the interwebs, and, and uh, yeah, messaged you. And uh, I think the first question you asked me is, "Well, where did you train?" And I'm like, "Well, don't hate me, but <laughs> I didn't." Uh, and how much does that training, that non-training, cost you so far? More than training? Uh, yes, it <laughs> it would have been cheaper for me to definitely uh, definitely would have been cheaper for me to get training and buy the right equipment the first time instead of taking four tries to buy the right stuff um <laughs> well now you have the right stuff you've got your flight products with the efi and that's just sick yeah well now i have the best paramotor in the world well but, it's because you built it yourself well yeah and that's why it's best <laughs> does it have crumple zone oh all the crumple zone i need <laughs> This is when our video gets flagged. Um, all right, so I'm going to tell my side of the story because it's kind of cool for me. Okay. I love all the guys at Flight Test. They 
were the most fun people we had taught up to that point. They were just super natural. Like any RC airplane pilot gets it because they're used to flying airplanes, score themselves doing things in reverse. So reverse kiting is super easy. Plus, they have a great mission. They have this idea of sharing aviation with the masses and yep. making it affordable, making it something that's attainable for people. They're great people. They really are. And it, they, they love sharing their love of flight with others, which is very similar to your passion. It was a really natural fit for us. And they learned to fly in four days, and they crushed it, and we had a great time. And then you pop on the scene. You're like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fly. And I was like, ah, oh, good training. And then you reach out to me. You say, listen, I'm an engineer. I work for Ready Made RC. And this is about six months after Flight Test Learned to Fly, maybe eight. Actually, it was probably more than that. It was probably almost a year. And they had been working on some projects for us. And we were five prototypes deep in our strobe project. And I had this idea. I wanted a strobe. And I'd just seen Guardians of the Galaxy, right? So I wanted a strobe that looked like a mohawk. Yondu. Like, I wanted Yondu. I wanted a whistle and have an arrow show up, right? I wanted it to look like a diff, like a, a, a balance between a mohawk and an ILS approach light beacons, where like it was like, and dude, Bixler was amped. Chad was helping. We we're gonna have this super cool strobe light that mounts to your helmet, looks like a mohawk, and then nothing happened. Five prototypes in. They're so busy doing their own projects. I, I don't fault them at all. But they, like, they couldn't do anything. She reached out to me and said, can you help me with a strobe? And actually, I wonder if, if someone can grab a, a, a North Star so we can show this. And I, I told you about my idea. I talked to Bixler. Bixler's like, dude, if, if Alex will help you, do it. Like, don't, don't hesitate. Don't feel like you're hurting feelings. Like, at least it's getting done. I showed you the idea. I showed you the prototype. You're like, we can make it better. And you did. You made it better. I do wish it made the little... I want seven different LEDs, like seven squares, that all just make it look like I'm flying it like an instrument approach. It'd be really cool. That's V2. V2. V2 is supposed to have a camera in it. Still working on that. Actually, this that in would be V3. We, we just released V2. We didn't really announce it, but we re-released V2 because we had about a 2.5% return rate for issues on V1. We did. And now V2 is out, which corrected the, the way the USB charging system worked. And so this is V2. Thank you, Alex. Montanus. So it comes with a, a little nice sticker. Um, this is the North Star. Was that yeah. your name? Did you come up with that name? I, I think did. you did. Yeah. yeah. Freaking awesome name. Got to know where to look. North, look, North look Star. Look the North Star. It's a great name. I don't name. know. So this is the North Star show. This is built and designed to be mounted on a helmet, on a cage, on a frame. I'm of the opinion that... I want 40 strobes on everything. I want to be look I want like to be a seen. UFO. Yeah. Where I fly, there is a tremendous amount of general aviation traffic, and I want to do absolutely everything that I can to be visible to other aircraft. And right. So I, it doesn't matter if it's the middle of the day. I always fly with my strobe on. It's once I have it, it's free to use it. Like I, it's it. It is not just a before sunrise or after sunset I'm type thing way. for me. I always have it on. I want to be seen by everybody I possibly can be. I can't say I do it every flight, but the majority of my flights, my wingtips are going, which we'll talk about wingtip strobes next. Uh, wingtips are going, North Star is going, just because we fly out of General Aviation Airport. And the reality yeah. is we don't have much traffic here. I'm more concerned about other paramotors seeing me because we have a ton of paramotor traffic, and I want to make sure that they can actually see me. So... For us, the North Star was, we tell people that a, a power flow and a reserve are cheap insurance, right? It's a cheap insurance policy on your life. Yep. In my opinion, a North Star is like buying time. It's like buying a watch where you value your time, right? A North Star gives you an hour a day, 365 hours a year, right? So that is why we developed the North Star. Alex is the brains behind that, the operation. What you did with all these lights with dealing with the heating and because we had issues early on we did i delivered the first prototypes to you at oshkosh last year and they were they worked awesome they turned on and worked fantastic for they, your they shows, wouldn't turn off they, they didn't turn off <laughs> it's better than not turning on but we do need it we did need them to turn off i think that the v1 of the north star was technically the ninth prototype it was the ninth variant and that's what people don't understand it's like when I sent you three or four ones that were 3D printed and all 
hodgepodge together just to uh, try to figure out what would work. To see what we wanted to look like and see. It flashed it, it didn't see if the curved would figure. The, ma- the majority of the helmets out there. I'm going to mess the camera up, and I'm also going to make you have to reinstall this later. But I'm just going to I'm going to show because we wanted to mess with flash modes, right? We did. And so early on, it was trying to figure out how many flashes were enough. And I'm hurting the people behind the camera so much. Oh, this thing's almost dead. So we wanted to add enough frequency for paradigm shows. So it was it was a ghastly affair. We wanted five five flashes. Is it five flashes per second? So. It's God, not that quite hurts that, my eyes. It's not <laughs> quite that many. There's five different flashing modes, and the fastest mode is flashing is a double flash, uh, pretty much like one time every 1.2 seconds or something like that. I, well, because otherwise I it overheated. Right. right. Yeah. We we had to dial it back just a bit because we are pushing that circuitry to its absolute limit. I think that's the thing that people don't realize is like, and this is why I wanted you on the show. We're, we're talking about the rudimentary things first, but the reality is that even something as simple as a North Star strobe is nine prototypes deep before production, a ridiculous amount of money for the mold fee. Yeah. Like I think we'll pay it back after we sell our 700th strobe, right? It, it, it's, it was a lot of development. I think people un- underestimate the amount of light output that comes out from that strobe um some people are like oh was it just a double a battery in there and like well if the battery dies can i just change it and uh, you could change the battery but you're gonna have to buy you could but but it's not the right it's not just a double a battery it's not just a fancy flashlight in a funny shape it's they're literally the brightest leds that we could buy that would fit in that form factor and Honestly, the, the, the reason it was overheating is because we were pushing them so hard that it was, it, it was overheating the circuit board. I want to double the flashes because I am kind of a masochist and just wanted to kill my eyes. We wanted, it, <laughs> we wanted it to be the brightest possible strobe light that it could be in the smallest possible form <clears throat> factor. And, and that's, that's what we did. We got it. So, Alex, this is our first project together. Alex developed the concept. He developed the form factor. He was able to showcase... A lot of engineering talent, and while certainly there are things to learn from, like uh, Nick, I uh, can't even, I think it was in the chat earlier, and he was like, listen, here's some things we could change, I sent it to you, and we came out with V2, we changed how we supported the USB charging mm-hmm. port, because that was an issue. Yep. And so we're constantly developing and changing, but then our next project together, I think our next project together was the EFI, actually. We had several kind of going simultaneously. The, the next one to the customers were aware of, I think, was the wingtip strobe lights. So the, one thing you guys don't understand or may not know is that each of these products has a pretty large timeline behind it. Like yeah. this project was around for, 120 days, four months, five months. Oh, what do you mean? From inception to production or to, oh. to sales for this project. Probably more than that. You think it was more? Yeah. I mean, just just a simple strobe light and a ridiculous amount of money, money and a ridiculous amount of your time. And like, one thing I want to be very clear with people is like, we're not directly paying Alex for his time. We partner with Alex on these projects because we deeply respect his his abilities and we want to make sure that he profits from it too. So like, his time is our profit. Like, it's it's it, we share because it's really important to us. And at the time, he was still working for ReadyMade RC on this project. And after that, you retired. At how old? I wouldn't say I retired. I, I changed you, lines I, of work. I didn't say you had money to retire. I said you retired. <laughs> I quit my day job. <laughs> How old were you? 27. 27. And you quit your day job because you had a passion for developing things for paramotors, right? Yeah. I, uh, I started paramotoring and found uh, the general – well, the first thing that I – was frustrated with was the general reliability of paramotors because they're the motors are all pieces junk. of crap yeah all of them all of them even the ones we sell there none of them are good all paramotor wings are great the all wings, paramotors are, are garbage yep <laughs> however the wings are significantly better than they used to be they, and the motors are significantly the, better than they used so to be so that that wing yeah. that i bought on craigslist uh was made in 2001 and uh i it did fly but Things have gotten a lot better since then. They keep improving. Yes. But at any rate, um, 
I thought that there were some opportunities to uh, improve the paramotor community through better products. Well, and the thing is, I love the way you attacked it because obviously you like to say you're an engineer, you're not good on camera, I, I call it BS. The reality is you have an incredibly brilliant, engaging mind. You have the ability to look at a problem. And like for me, I can look at a problem like I don't like any of the strobe lights. And I can come up with a Mohawk strobe that flashes seven times, but I don't understand heat sink. I don't understand battery power. I don't understand easy charging. I don't understand multimodal switch that uses a, a, a circuit board to control how many flashes. You were able to look at the problem and understand all the problems that are associated with it. So our first project was the North Star. Then we did the publicly the wingtip strobe. I think that the EFI came around the same time, which is a year ago, year and a half ago. Probably, yeah. Um, and you and I both had the same mission, which the mission was how do we develop and make things better? The EFI was created, thank you, Dale, um, because so much of the issues that people were experiencing, for particularly the, the brand we sold previously, we were having overheating issues, um, we were having crankcase issues, we were having issues. It didn't have as many issues as the previous brand I'd sold, right? Where I had 21 engine outs in a year and it was largely due to overheating, but EFI would have solved it. We were seeing people get prop strikes because they could, they're having so much trouble starting the motor on their back, they'd start it on the ground, so they're chopping their arms off, literally. EFI solved that, it reduced fuel consumption by 30%, and people had tried it. When, I, when you first brought me the idea, I told you, I said, listen, like, we sat down with, with uh, the folks at Technofly, who are incredible engineers, really sharp people, and we talked to them about it. Because at the time, Kyle was super ecstatic about the idea of EFI, he wanted EFI. And they said, listen, we tried. We can't find a, a system that allows power supply to be accurate and the fuel mapping is an issue and they said you know top 80 the, the top engines they had tried and they brought one to the world championship with this great plan that they're going to fly it in the world championship and win because they have efis so they're going to save 50 percent of their fuel and blah 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 and they ended up not being able to fly it at all and other companies had tried it and what i love is that mind you it took over a year but you were able to come outside the box completely and create a new generator system, create a system that has redundancies that work, that we've had ze a zero failure rate on the engine. We've had a couple brackets break in the early models before you reinforced them. Yep. Because we're totally transparent. Um, but we've got, we have five units running with it, I think. Four, and yours, so five total. Sure. Um, with a zero failure rate. Correct, yeah. The there have been f failures to be transparent on things that are other things that we haven't developed that have been bolted onto the engine. So you're saying exhaust and starters and things that break on paramotors. Yes, the normal things <laughs> still break, but at least the engine runs well. And it runs better than well. We, we have it on our tandem unit, which is filling a ton. Yep. Um, my dad flies tandems on it all the time. It's his, it's his unit now. Um, and that thing runs pretty flat out. Yep, he took me for a ride this morning. It was great. You took him for a ride this morning. I did. So Alex is working on his tandem certification. Um, I don't know what RPMs is running. What would you estimate RPM wise? Um, the fuel injection actually allows the uh, RPMs to increase by two to three hundred. So we're actually seeing eighty-seven, eighty-eight hundred wow. on the very top end. Um, Sort of depends on the propeller you're using, but we're seeing a slight increase in RPM, uh, which is therefore thrust power, and therefore yeah. power. Um, so there is a slight power increase. Um, but to be honest, I I didn't set out on this fuel injection venture to increase power because honestly, there's a lot of really powerful motors out oh, there yeah. that already work. They're, alre they're already really yeah. powerful, to be honest. Like, Although my tornado burned nine and a half liters an hour. Right. So. Uh, honestly, <laughs> the, the, but, but the reason that I, I'm not an ideas guy, and I've told you that several times. You are a solutions guy. I'm a solutions guy. 100%. But I was so frustrated with the first three paramotors that I bought and their inconsistencies and their issues that I was just really frustrated. And I thought, 
okay, this this is supposed to be quote unquote an airplane. This is right. this is how I fly through the sky and it is significantly less reliable than my lawnmower. And that is <laughs> that is that's unacceptable. Or your one wheel. Yeah, well, that, <laughs> but but that's unacceptable. I want the thing that keeps me safe in the sky to be it, it as reliable as possible. And, and it should be. And the reality is we have sacrificed weight for so long mm-hmm. to make it easier to launch. Yep. We've sacrificed reliability for weight. We've sacrificed reliability for fuel consumption. We've sacrificed reliability for sex appeal. We've, we've sacrificed reliability for a lot of things. And what your EFI has done is that it has truly, like it, it truly has created much more reliable paramotors yep. and more fuel efficient, more reliable, easier to start. We had a guy buy one, or, one, or he, I don't know if he actually paid for it, but he got, contacted us this week. Um, He's the king of random on YouTube. He has 10 million subscribers. He learned to fly with us last October. He had 100 flights, or 105 flights, yep. in his week of training. Baller. Um, he was like, listen, I live in Utah, and it's high altitude, and I've had more trouble starting the damn thing and tuning the carburetor. He's like, give me EFI. I want it. So your EFI solves those problems because it automatically senses what the, what the atmosphere yep. is doing. Compensates for altitude, temperature, atmospheric conditions. So, so if I fly in Death Valley, I'm good. Yeah, that's so sick. <laughs> yeah, my, uh, I, there were several occasions where I was with my previous equipment where I'd try and go fly, and you know it's middle of summer, really hot. You lay your wing out, you get your wing on your back, you walk out to where the wing is, and you try and start your motor, and it just doesn't start, and you're exhausted over, from over, walking over out again. there already, and you're carrying. Well, my first several paramotors were very heavy and you're just pulling this and pulling it and pulling it or you start it doesn't matter but just for a variety of reasons it did start and when it, it's perfect conditions and your motor won't start that is one of the most frustrating experiences I've ever had in this industry and I wanted to fix that I and and you did I did you absolutely did so uh, we did the North Star then we made this is Honestly, this is specifically for Paradigm because we, if, if you look at flying paramotors as a religion where it changes your life and blah, 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 it's, it sounds like a cultish thing to say, but we look at Paradigm as our, as our revival tent. <laughs> so we wanted something that would wow people when we went to Oshkosh. And so we use these little firefighter strobes. The firefighters can find each other. And it uses half the number of strobes. And I wasn't happy with the output. I wasn't happy with... The, the timeline because they kept dying over and over again. We had to keep recharging them every every performance. You know, we have a twenty minute performance. We're like, we gotta make sure they're charged again because they keep dying. So we developed this little bitty, which is a, a, a ten strobe unit. I'm gonna turn it on. Guard your eyes. Yeah. Dude, honestly, it's two hours, three it's hours not, of work. But we want to make sure people have the best possible experience with it. Right. And it's not worth it to us for somebody to think they know what they're getting into, but quickly realize they're in over their head and they right. just have a negative experience overall so well in, we, in early early iterations of the of the efi we had issues I and mean, i remember at one point we you flew down like last minute like 16 hours before you flew down and i was like hey man we're having issues that we can't even run the thing we're about to put carburetors back on and you flew down you took your laptop you flashed new software to it and all of a sudden the engines ran better than they've ever run before in their life because it was so much development to get to that point so we want to ensure that anyone who goes through this process can ensure a positive experience yeah we want to make sure that anyone that any end users that end up with this technology have somebody that they can get FaceTime with that can explain to them how it works how to use it properly right and you know, and if they have any questions that they can ask somebody knowledgeable face to face instead of needing to rely on the internet for for answers. Absolutely, and in the back end of it, somebody just said fifteen hundred dollars. Michael Dan Antonio to, to or Dan Dan Antonio, yes, Michael. Uh, to give you a little perspective, um, just so you understand the investment. So first off, the parts themselves on our initial kits were over eleven hundred dollars per kit. Just to be very clear. I think it was 1147 or 1142 per kit in parts cost alone not ta- not counting the time to make the loom the time to make the wiring harness the time to create the entire uh 
power band and, and, and program everything. On the back end of that, we had now five units, five units at an average cost of $8,000 per unit. We have $40,000 in units, hundreds of hours of flight time. Um, this is not a small investment for Aviator or for Alex. Like we've, we've invested a ton of time and money. And please understand that the, the $1,500 includes installation. Yes, Pablo just asked that. It, it does include installation. It's, this, is, this is not a, quite frankly, this is one of the least profitable things we do. Um, our expectation with the EFI is that this is literally, it is for a niche client who wants either better reliability, better fuel consumption, or easier starting. This is not for everybody. It's not cheap. Uh, yes, it's five times the cost of a carburetor, or se seven times the cost of a carburetor. But if you hate carburetors like as much as I do, you'll understand. And, and this will be the future. It will be. It's undeniable. It, it, Every it, other yeah. power sport industry, motorcycles, um, snowmobiles, jet skis, dirt bikes, absolutely everything. I mean, you, chainsaws. Yeah, golf, chainsaws. Golf have carts, EFI. everything. Everything has fuel injection. Anything with a motor has fuel injection. Except nowadays. for paramotors. But fans don't have it. But now they do. Well, and that, now because they it's do. Better. It, it is. It is on paper. It is absolutely better in every way. Well, and not just on paper. We've seen it day to day. We're adding it to our school units, so so students will be able to fly with EFI because. Well, they already have been. Well, they have been, but we're going to put it on all the school units. Right. We're going to put it on every school unit we utilize because we see that how much easier it is to start. We see how much better the fuel consumption is. We're going through 500 gallons of fuel every two months in our school. Right. That's a lot of gas. If we can add an extra month. Yep. That's a huge savings over, over time. Well, but for the average consumer, I don't think that the, the fuel, the 30% fuel savings is... Unless they're flying is, Icarus. Is, well, but I don't think that that should be viewed as a cost savings, so more as a weight savings. Ooh, that's a solid point. You what, don't need the, as much fuel. You don't need to carry as much fuel on your back to fly for the same amount of time as you would normally fly. So what, if you know you only need to fly for an hour, you can use you can you have to carry less weight in your back to, to fly for that same period. What's of time. The, what's the entire unit weigh difference between uh, carbureted and fuel injected? About two point three pounds. So less than a half a gallon of fuel. Significantly less. Okay, so less than a half a gallon of fuel. Good. All right. Um, Ty Jelke asks, does this come with tuning software? The ability to, to retune is needed. Absolutely not. We do not want anybody <laughs> else tuning it. That is exactly why I developed this. There are, there's absolutely nothing that you can change yourself, and that is on purpose. And it's because we've already tried changing everything you might need to change, including altitude, including temperature. He's sending me videos. This is back in, uh, I think, November, December, when we had the first, the first prototype, and it's like six degrees in Ohio, and he goes outside, and he goes, I'm like, screw you. I can't do that in Florida. <laughs> yeah. It, carb, we have, I, well, I can't speak for you, but I have seen way too many people try and tune their carburetor be, you know, to be better for their location, and they end up making it far worse than it ever should have been. And then that causes significant motor damage and problems down the road. And every, then, People that know that they don't have the knowledge to do it themselves, they'll have their lawnmower mechanic friend yep. try and tune it up for them. Oh my gosh, and I have a story that for you. Makes everything worse as well. We wanted to, I, I wanted to take all the guessing out of this. I wanted to turn your paramotor into the performance of your car. It into just always iPhone? starts. Well, no, I don't do none of that iPhone <laughs> business. But when is the last time your car didn't start your car always starts it doesn't unless matter. the battery's dead you're golden well right but in, but it doesn't matter if it's hot or cold or if you're in colorado or in florida your car will always start hot humid doesn't matter it just always starts so ty ty if you're a mechanical engineer and you understand everything about how an, a two-stroke engine works you understand everything about how the computer systems for power band and everything else works then feel free feel free to reach out to Alex, and maybe he'll share software with you so you can blow up your own engine. Uh, otherwise, it's been well tested and it works. Um, and you're already voiding your warranty from Viterazzi, so that's a big deal. Uh, please don't void your warranty from us, too. Yeah. So I see uh, somebody was asking about, Ken uh, was asking about priming. That's another thing that I this love. This is the coolest thing about it. You don't need to prime it. You turn all. it on. You, you turn it on. You wait, turn the master three switch seconds. on. You'll hear the fuel pip. You'll excuse me. You'll hear the fuel pump kick on, 
and you let it do its thing for about three seconds. You hear the fuel pump shut off. You know the system is primed. You're ready to go, and you either do your e start or pull the cord. And it, it doesn't matter which. It works on both pull starts or dual start units. Um, and no priming. You just turn the switch on and go. The coolest thing I've seen so far is like on the tandem unit because that'll fly five, six flights in the morning. I have never pulled it more than twice. Yeah. Oh, if if it takes more than three times, something's wrong, and that has pretty much never happened. I pulled. It, I've never pulled it more than twice. Not not one time have I ever pulled the EFI units more than one. Yeah. More than twice. Yeah. It, Once is the average. Maybe one point two times. Yeah. It it's it just always starts. You don't have so to think nice. about it. You you don't have to prime it. You don't have to worry. But you don't have to read, especially on the new air boxes. It's hard to reach under the little thing and push it's the, the button. It's the biggest pain in the you butt. You can't reach it, and you you just don't have to mess with that anymore. Partha says EFI would be perfect for the tornado to eighty to lower fuel consumption. I hope Alex considers working on EFI for other motors next. Hi Partha. Hi Partha. One of the things that Alex and I have been, have been talking about a lot is what motors would be next, and there's not that many tornadoes out there. It would be great to do it, but you have to count the cost. So we have five test bed motors that have been operating a lot, spending a lot of time, a lot of a lot of consumption, a lot of investment um, in order to bring this to market. I, mean, I, I would I don't want to put a number out there without actually researching it, but it's 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 in the high five figures that we've invested between the investment capital and the time capital um, to to bring the, the the moster to life, to do it with a with a tornado or something else like that i mean i just talked to mateo earlier today they've sold 1500 mosters since the mi19 was released that's a lot of mosters the market's just not there for other motors it's just not there while you may do it it will literally be you doing it out of the kindness of your heart and your passion versus it being right. a profitable project just like the, this project I, I, yeah I, I actively chose to start with the moster due to its popularity in the industry yeah. Um, and something you brought up that uh, I feel like people may be interested in, um, it is, this is not just a new sales option. Right. People with existing mosters can upgrade to yep. EFI. Um, but for the listeners and viewers, um, if you haven't, if, you, if your motor was pre the MY19, it must be a dual start for right. the brackets to line up and for everything to work. No offense, but if they're flying a pre-MY19, right now, Viterazzi's prices are so low. Upgrade. John Jensen up upgraded a few weeks ago. It, why not? It's 2700 bucks. Sure. Upgrade your motor. It, it's If you've got some time on it and you want a backup engine, upgrade. The MY19 is such a huge leap forward in reliability. I, I was just going through warranty numbers with Mateo earlier today, and... We sold 110 paramotors, uh, Viterazzi motors this year. We've had two, two muffler issues with a four spring exhaust. We've had every single three spring exhaust have to be replaced. Yep. That alone is enough to go to the MY19. The airbox, I, I like the idea of the tether because they do fail. Uh, we had five out of 110 fail. Um, or four, four or five fail out of 110. Um, but still, it's it's something to keep in mind. Like you want to put yourself in a position where you're flying the best thing because your life. I mean, obviously you're still flying a paraglider and you can land in a field. But if you're going to fly in any situation where a landing option is not great, you want to fly the best thing you can fly. It, it's really frustrating to have a motor issues. So yeah, I mean, it, it says the man with motor issues. Well, not anymore. But <laughs> it's it's worth flying the right equipment that will keep you safe. Oh, 100%. Pablo Pyro says, that's easy for you to say, $2,700 lying around, not me. I don't have $2,700 lying around. I have a huge payroll to pay every month, and I will tell you straight up, I don't have it either. Um, what I would encourage you to consider is financing is available through Aviator. Um, you can look into other options. You can sell your previous motor. Uh, we have the one that, that John had replaced, sold for fifteen hundred bucks, right? Or up for sale for fifteen hundred bucks. So, it may not be the easiest thing, but this is the cheapest form of aviation. Um, however, it is still not cheap because it's aviation. It's not. All right. If if you make it cheap, it won't be safe. 
Well, and that's a big thing. That's what I started off with. I tried to make it as cheap as possible, and it, it ended up not being safe for me. And you almost landed in a soccer goal. I, yeah. <laughs> so there's more story there. I want to take a moment. We're an hour and 40 minutes in. Um, it's 7.37, I think. Uh, I want to introduce this because this is something that we've been working on, you and I, for a really long time. People have been asking about it for a really long time. This, guys, is the Aviator Throttle. To answer Cliff Brown, Aviator Throttle, when? The answer is right now. It's right available now. on the store. Link is in the chat, or will be in a moment. This is the Aviator Throttle. And I'm going to I'm gonna walk you guys through it slowly. So this is not a... a <laughs> An easy thing. This has been a long process. This one right here, if you want to come away from the light, John, so they can see a little better. This has a foam grip, which you can remove if you choose to. The initial versions didn't have the foam grip. It is a on-off switch on the top. So the, the switch right here actually turns on and off. It's not a momentary switch. It's a, it's a simple switch, which is really phenomenal. If your hand's in it, it has an elastic bungee strap to be able to, contr to fit your hand as necessary. Um, it is fully loomed in, so everything is clean. It's carbon fiber, and it's built. When you and I were talking about this yesterday, uh, Alex. This is built with the same design sensibility as a race drone, a race quad. Yep, that's what I did for four years, and made some of the best in the industry. And so I uh, kind of took that design experience and applied it to paramotor throttles because I recognized that one of the biggest problems with existing throttles was their durability. Um, I knew of a lot of people that would, uh, while they're clipping in or doing something, or just generally putting on the paramotor, they would drop the throttle, then they'd back up and they'd step on it. And if you have a plastic throttle, it'd probably crack in half and then you're useless. Um, and so I wanted to make something that was lightweight, that was durable, that was easy to service if you ever do have a problem. Um, and uh, so, so that's what we did. I, I took uh, what I had learned in the drone industry and, and brought it to uh, permanent throttles. Well, and what I wanted, because I'm not the engineer, I wanted something that was comfortable to fly with. I fly with these two three fingers on the throttle, and generally, most throttle uh, arms are too long, because I want my, my toggle in my top two fingers, right? So most throttles, in general, are too long so that it gets blocked, so I end up having to have two fingers on the toggle, three fingers on the throttle. Sometimes that, that toggle can get trapped in between the, the throttle uh, yep, arm. That's happened to me. Yeah, so and we've seen it happen with students many, many times. So we wanted something that was clean, that was light, and that was ridiculously strong. So you can literally take out, what is this, five screws on this side, and I think there's two more up here. So seven screws, and pull it apart. Let's say you're, you're throttle cable itself frays or breaks you get sand inside something something goes wrong with it it is completely modular and it allows itself to be completely taken apart with the easiest of efforts and switched from left hand dominant to right hand dominant throttle well and that's a big thing too we want to have something that's, that's easily swapped so this can literally rotate around i can try to do it on screen it's no, not going to no the you, you take you take the elastic out and swap it to the other side so I fly mine without any foam at all. So I fly like this left hand throttle. And if the carbon fiber bothers your hand, you can slide this down over the top, then it Heat shrink removes it on. the rough edges. Right, so there's there's definitely different options. I I wanted foam because some people really prefer it. Uh, I find for an hour flight, no foam is necessary. We, we included this, it was added to the, to the bill of lading. But everything's incorporated. And what's really cool about it is every single one of these, it's not, like every other brand I've seen out there, not every other, most other brands I see out there are pull start or e start, right? Mm -hmm. This one, with your hand still wrapped in it, I can reach over and with my pinky, hit the e start. Hit button. the e start button. There's an e start button hidden behind the throttle, so you can turn that that starter on. Literally, if your hand's locked in, pinky in, and you have it, or you can reach across and hit that. We looked into so many different options. We looked into doing a. Uh, a microprocessor that would allow it to turn on turn off like nirvana does we looked into adding a second start switch on the top we looked into so many different options and this seemed like the simplest way to guard it so you couldn't accidentally start yep. it and to ensure simplicity because those other throttles out there that utilize micro switches they fail you know you have a computer failure you have an issue yep. so this is available guys it's simple it's nice uh it does not come in orange yet ty david uh, if you want an orange one, uh, send in a special request, and eventually it's definitely possible. But this is something I'm really, really 
I'm honestly, I'm proud of it. I'm proud of what we've done for this. It's been a big process, and you've done a hell of a job. I think it's a good product. I think that it'll, uh, I think it'll be very good for a lot of people. It will. And so uh, the price right now in the store, guys, is twenty dollars less than the price will be eventually. Um, so if you want it right now from this, it's one seventy nine. It's taken a ridiculous amount of effort, but it's it's available right now on our store. The uh, somebody just asked about whether or not there's cruise control available. I'll let you answer why we don't have cruise control. We did not put cruise control on this. Uh, in my personal opinion, cruise control is dangerous. Yep. Um, I feel that it is dangerous because if you are flying along with your brakes stowed and you're just having a grand old time and playing on your phone or just looking around, it doesn't matter. But if your throttle is locked in any kind of mechanical way and you hit any kind of weird turbulence or somebody else's wake, it doesn't really matter what. If, if you hit any kind of event that causes your wing to react in a way that you need to reduce throttle immediately with which it, is the with safe, within yeah less than a second and that's the safe thing to do you want to reduce throttle so the wing can can surge properly and get maximize right. pressure yeah there's so many things where reducing the throttle is immediately necessary and if you have cruise control you can't do that immediately and there's a lot of times where that would be fine but it is that's not worth the risk in my opinion no, I, I completely agree. That's why we didn't need cruise control. I, I've flown many throttles with cruise control without um, my Nirvana Instinct, which is an incredibly well-designed motor, had so many issues around the cruise control. You pulled, if you pulled a full, full power and accidentally set the cruise control, you couldn't un unclick it without having to take the entire throttle apart, which was not this easy. It was a big project. Uh, so I am a huge fan of the idea of simplicity being key. If your body your two fingers, your ring finger and your pinky finger on either hand can't handle holding two and a half pounds, three pounds of pressure for a three hour flight. Um, work out your hands guys. <laughs> like seriously, it's, it's a, it's a safer option and we're always going to offer what we believe is a safer option because it's super important to us. So, uh, with that said, guys, EFI is available. It has, undergone an immense amount of testing, an immense amount of effort to get it to where it is. The throttles are available, obviously the strobes are available. We're working on new projects. I wanna talk some about the electric project that oh scares man. you. Oh man. <laughs> What's the thrust feel like? You're the only one who's played with this. I haven't, he has an electric Top paramotor. Top secret, we're not supposed to be talking about it. He has an electric paramotor that I, I, I paid for and I haven't flown it yet. It's true. Where is it? It's in my garage. How close is it to flying? Uh, tremendously. Well, it's ready to it's fly. It's about 1,100 miles away from being ready. <laughs> so it's designed to be a most 185 replacement. It is. Uh, have you tested duration? How much duration are you getting? So from the testing that I've done on the ground, um, I believe that 25 minutes of realistic flight so what what other manufacturers say would be fifty? Yeah, <laughs> I, I think you know I think that twenty five minutes of flying like a normal paramotor pilot should be expected. Now that said, one of the things so we came to electrics with a very different perspective because your experience in the drone industry, you saw the open PPG, you saw all the other motors out there, and we saw that they're using hobby level equipment. They're burning out ESCs. They're having issues with reliability. We wanted to go the opposite direction. We wanted to have industrial grade, high quality stuff. Yep. The students are flying outside again. We can hear them. Uh, we wanted to ensure that we had higher reliability and we wanted to have batteries that were not going to catch fire. That is the biggest thing. Well, and not only is it the biggest thing, in my opinion, is the biggest drawback. If you're going to put 24 LiPo batteries on your back, you run a high risk. Right, you run a, a very high risk because you've, you've I, had friends' houses burned down. I know two people personally and about four people casually that have burnt down various parts of, if not their entire house, from LiPo batteries. I dealt with them on a daily basis for four years, and uh, I think that the vast majority of people drastically underestimate the 
potential dangers of lipo batteries after you told me a few stories i moved all my hobby lipos on my drone batteries out of my house it it's it's laughable but it's not it's like, not it's really they, not. they can be dangerous i had a, a very dear friend in the paramedic community who uh who's also an avid hobbyist with a rc stuff and his house burned down his yep. truck melted you know it's it's not a big deal so it's not a little deal rather i should say uh, Robert Weir says, how heavy would it be? So uh, what I currently have is, of course, a prototype. Um, and it is less than a normal, most are equipped Parajet. Uh, I don't want to say exactly how much because it is a prototype. And I know for fact that there will be several differences between what I currently have and what it can be. Um, if but we go to titanium for the motor mounts, we're going to save at least a pound. If we go to, to carbon yeah. fiber for the battery box, we're going to save another pound, two pounds. Yeah, yeah. We're significantly less, I feel confident, saying significantly less than a traditional gas-powered motor. So with batteries for 25 minutes, you're looking at less than 60 pounds. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So uh, it's definitely something that's it's not featherweight by any means. Thank you. Uh, but it's usable. Our intent with it was to offer it to people who really wanted to have an electric option. Yep. And we wanted to use it in our school. Now, going to EFI in our school, we may not use it immediately because the biggest reason why we were going to use it in our school was we wanted to avoid all the troubles we have with gas-powered engines. Um, but I anticipate that we'll probably end up with 50-50 EFI and uh, battery-powered because one of the things we started talking about was the batteries being dangerous on most of the battery powered units. Yep. We avoided that. Totally different route. We went to a off the shelf, you can buy it at your local Lowe's, uh, battery solution that's not as inexpensive, um, but it allows us to be safer, to use an off the shelf charging solution, to not have to know battery technology, and most importantly, to allow you to go to Lowe's and buy some more batteries and you can increase your flight time. You know, the average flight for most pilots is under an hour. Oh. There, are, You know, I think the average is probably, we should probably run a poll. The last time I've asked people, the average is around 38 minutes. Um, so we can, we can swap batteries on the fly. And our plan with the school is to have a stack of batteries sitting on the, the uh, four-wheeler ready to go. So we can hot swap batteries for students. They can keep flying the electric unit and have it be simple. The last thing we have to do on the, on the electric right now is we need to modify it so it can use this throttle. And then we need to get the production models out with the carbon fiber battery trays. With the and, and the cool part about all of this is right now the best battery powered unit on the market, the best electric paramotor on the market, sells for fifteen thousand dollars in the U.S. This should be comparable to a Moster. Yeah. So it'll be a little more expensive. Fair warning. Um, but right now we're expecting it to be comparable in price. So if it's if you can buy a Moster for twenty eight hundred bucks, this would hopefully be less than four grand. Yep. That's the goal. So it's coming together. Cliff Brown bought a throttle. Cliff Brown just bought a throttle. He said, "When is it available?" Cliff, it's available now. Thanks for asking. Thanks for buying. My my four year old daughter Eloise is going to be very happy because she gets to eat tonight, and uh, your your dog Bane will be happy because he gets tonight eat tonight too. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, Joe Sasher asks, efficiency is improved by reducing fuel going with EFI. Does this have a negative effect on lubrication in the cooling of the motor? No. <clears throat> so... Kind of. I suppose that's fair. Uh, <laughs> it does not have a negative effect on the motor. I argue strongly that the EFI actually makes the motor run optimally. Uh, the carburetor that comes on the Mosters by default runs extremely pretty rich, rich. Extremely rich. Way more rich than is needed for proper combustion. Um, and uh, Well, and they, they do that because it's supposed to run at the same level of mixture throughout the low range, and then it has to shift into right. the higher the the Carburetors are mechanical devices. They right. they always they have to be designed to err on the side of caution because they're not capable of adapting to every environment or situation, but EFI is. And so the 
carburetors by default they just err on the side of running rich which is the safe thing to do absolutely but the efi allows the motor to actually run more efficiently and run exactly at the stoichiometric ratio and he just used words i don't even know what they mean it it is the optimal ratio (laughs) of air to fuel right per firing of the engine and uh due to that it allows the engine to run at peak efficiency which does cause the motor to run a little warmer than with the carburetor but you can but it is that. not too warm right uh, we do strongly recommend if not say it's mandatory to use a carbon fiber cooling shroud which drops the temperature about 20 degrees fahrenheit uh, yeah i i on my test i saw about 80 to 100 degrees fahrenheit drop in really temperatures. i yeah. thought it was less than with that. the fuel injection okay so yeah with with Without the cooling shroud, if you are in an extended climb, you definitely could run the risk of overheating your motor. But with the cooling shroud, we ab- you, you can't do it. You cannot overheat your motor. We have done very, very long 100% power climbs on the tandem rig, on everything with as much weight as we can. We have run at full power for very long periods of time, and you will not ever come close to damaging your we motor. haven't had one yet I and mean, with a absolutely not a lot of hours it won't happen rob very tenacity will the throttle be an option on new parajet orders from the factory rob i encourage you to email parajet and let them know you want the aviator throttle uh we had simon here a few weeks ago and we offered this and we hope that he will take us up on the offer we even made a custom blue one that matches their sexy blue and uh hopefully they'll say yes they they if we have enough demand for it i'm certain it will they currently offer three different throttles and they're working on their own new throttle. Uh, I think that this throttle meets the demands of comfort and reliability more than any other throttle in the market right now. That's why we designed it. It's why we work so hard on it. It's a big deal. So uh, I, I, we hope that Parajet and Fly Products will offer it as an option. Otherwise, it will be available aftermarket. And if you order one, we can help you install it. Ty, I see you're asking about the power band on the EFI. Oh, oh my God. That, that's something that I do want to <coughs> talk about. Um, what power band? Well, with a carburetor, uh, you have a low jet and a high jet. And, and it peaks ag- in between. Again, again, it's a mechanical device. It it can only work so well. The low jet can offer you power in this range, and the high jet can offer you power in this range. And there's it a, does, it there's does a its best. mid-range that's screwy. Which, coincidentally is usually right around where most people's cruise power is. Which is why you hear people flying going, wah, wah, wah. Right, right. exactly. Uh, EFI completely eliminates the weirdness and the changeover from the low to high jet. Uh, you should expect very smooth and consistent power. You should be able to just hold the throttle in your hand and just very incrementally step it up 50 RPM at a time all the way through the power band, all the way to max, to peak, R- peak RPM, and it you should be able to just run that up and down and be able to leave it at any set RPM and it'll just stay there. It literally, it it changes the game from being a feel thing to being incredibly precise. We we had Manu um, from our Paradigm team, Manu Tijero Lopez, who flies for um, the Paradigm team. He's one of the uh, Fly Products pilots, BGD's pilots, great guy, great pilot. He flew one of the early prototypes and he landed and he couldn't stop talking about it. He could not stop talking about how exceptional the power band was. And this is a guy who's a sponsor pilot from Viterazzi. One of the best pilots in the world. And we, he is. And, he, and he, he kept talking about the fact that there was no power band anymore. There was no question anymore. There was no differentiation between low and high. It was one constant smooth. He said it felt like an electric. Yep. And that's really what our big, our big goal was, um, was to put ourselves in a, in a position where it would be smoother, easier, and more controlled, more linear. Linear is everything, guys. Being able to make it linear, that's why we're putting them on our student units because you know how many times we've had students run forward their first inflation, the wings overhead, they're leaning back, they add power, all of a sudden the power band kicks in and it's like, Wah! and they, they jump. They jump on it their seat. It startles them. Because they don't anticipate that. So this yeah. will make it so much easier. Yeah. Which is why we've been putting people on the Atom, because the Atom's power band is much smoother. It is. So it's like, listen, like just fly the Atom until you get a few flights, and we'll put you on the Moster. Because they have to work for it more. They mm-hmm. have to use their body more, but it works. The, the, I mean, the Moster has a smooth power band to sp- beforehand. I mean, even compared to other units we've sold in the past, it's much smoother. But 
This is better. It is. <laughs> is the throttle going into a potential or rheostat encoder with EFI? Joe asks. Uh, there is a throttle position sensor on the EFI, but it is still a mechanic. As far as the consumer is concerned, the throttle is this throttle is the same whether it's put on the EFI unit or on a carbureted unit. Right. It is. It is pulling a mechanical device, whether it be the carburetor or the throttle body, right. it is moving a mechanical device um, on the EFI. It just has a sensor that reads that that level of input. Gotcha. All right, we have lots more questions coming through, guys. Tons of people asking about what batteries we're getting. Cliff Brown, uh, we have not tested Ryobi Echo Black & Decker. Uh, we have not tested the Echo 54 volt on the electric unit. What we're using right now, we can't reveal yet because we want to continue testing and ensure that it's going to have the reliability we're looking for. Uh, I believe that uh, we should have the electric unit shipped down here this next week. And so I get to start flying the pants off of it, which I'm super excited about. I'm really excited because the sound is so different. It's, it's significantly quieter. Like, it, it's not whisper quiet. Honestly, the prop makes a lot of the noise that you hear. But you don't have the high pitched whine of the two stroke, right? And you don't have you don't have any of the warble and any of the vibration. It's yeah. consistent and linear. The vibration is dramatically reduced. So one thing I that mean, I, I virtually none. I feel like it's worth mentioning. We literally designed this motor. Alex has some incredible contacts from his hobby experience, and he, he went to a motor manufacturer, and he we actually shipped them a, a prop directly from Eprops in France. And they're like, uh, we're not shipping an EPROP to Asia because you're going to copy it. And I said, no, 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 we're building an electric. So we shipped them a, a Moster prop. Yeah. And we said, listen, build a motor with 180 pounds of thrust based around this propeller. And so they yep. literally, they built a custom electric motor completely around the propeller. We started with where the thrust comes out and we built the rest of it around it. Yep. yep. And we built it all around the idea that we would build started from the business end and worked forward right and the only the only the only consideration we told them was listen here's the batteries we're using here's how many of them yep because we wanted it to be very seamless we wanted it to be a plug and play, play solution so you can take the motor on this beautiful volution three take it off take the fuel tank off and in maybe 30 minutes of, of retrofit time you know put four new bolts in put the battery carrier in swap your throttle and you should be able to fly again that's 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 the dream right yep. We're still not there yet. We were hoping to have it ready to fly by July-ish. I'm anticipating it ready to buy, not ready to fly. We're probably going to be August, September before we're close to being uh, in, in pre-sale ready. Speaking of pre-sales, we have very few people watching the stream tonight because we don't have YouTube going. But of Ew. the 70 of you guys watching tonight, I want to let you know that the EFI is available for pre-order. In the same way that the throttler is available for purchase now, the EFI is available for pre-order right now. If you'd like to purchase it, the link will be in the chat. Uh, it'll also be in the description of this video. It's 1500 bucks. You need to ship us your motor, or ship Alex your motor, or ship one of the authorized dealers your motor. We're building out an authorized dealer list right now. Alex is training on how to install, how to test. There's only gonna be 20 units available in the next pre-order batch something like that so if you want one or even if you're interested email us info at aviatorppg.com and we can help you get that pre-ordered jim Furman asks, will you have the electric at oshkosh uh probably show yes. up and find out probably yes jim will be there he's working in the, in the uh, tower good to see you jim uh andrew Finkin says i have some custom motors when i used to sell drone frames <laughs> i bet you do nina what did you say behind the camera we sold three EFIs already tonight, so I apologize if uh, they're sold out sooner than we anticipated. Uh, Cliff Brown says, Open PPG makes an electric paramotor with four motors, two pairs running reverse of each other to cancel P-factor, basically a quad on your back. Yes, we know, and we don't love it. What are your thoughts on it? Without being mean, without being, like, aviator rules. Uh, <laughs> it, they, I think, were, Open PPG, uh, I think, did a fantastic job bringing the first consumer I'll level. say consumer yep. true consumer level electric paramotor to the world and yeah, agreed and it works and uh I most know, of the time i know the the guys <clears throat> that are behind it and i think they're good people and um i think that there's a lot of great things about it uh we decided that we wanted to go with a single motor uh for a variety of reasons that I guess we probably don't need to get into tonight. Well, the, one of the big ones but, was we wanted it to be a, 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 
I think of an electric paramotor as being a part-time paramotor for most pilots. Right. Well, yes, I think that that's accurate. I think we, we wanted it to be a, a simple solution for people to quickly get in the sky for a quick rip. Right. It Electric will not, for many, many years, uh, be able to replace the endurance of a gasoline-powered engine. That's right. The, just the math isn't there yet. Um, so with that knowledge, we decided to just do the best with what is available to us. Right. And it, it seems like the best with, that we can do with the current technology that exists is make something that is simple, that is going to be reliable and easy to use for a shorter period of time. And well, and, and for me, the, the issue I've seen is OPPG tried to make it really, 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 really cheap, which they did. Mm-hmm. But, A, it's ridiculously loud. It sounds like a giant drone. It's, it's way louder than my Inspire 2. Like, it's way louder. Well, it, yeah. B, the reliability issues with the ESCs they chose is really bad. It's one of the things we talked about. Is like, listen, we have to have an ESC that works. It has to be overbuilt. Yep. Our, ES, our ESC, I can't, I think it was 500 bucks. Uh, yeah. Like, like our cost? Yes. It was a very expensive ESC for one, for one, right? Whereas if, if OpenBBG did the same thing with the same ESC, they're looking at $2,000 in ESCs to be able to have something that's more reliable. And it's nothing against the guys. I don't know them like you do. I, I, I follow the project very closely because it intrigued the heck out of me, you know, but if your life is on the line, relying on hobby grade equipment concerns me. Um, and at times, if you're flying and you have, if you have the confidence of thinking that you're going to have three extra motors to back you up if one goes out, the reality is it's still not ideal. The the th- the I at first I was really interested in the whole neutral torque idea, but with uh, good I thought that was really interesting. Right. However. Uh, as I learned more about everything relating to the whole paramotor world, there are so many ways to fix torque. Oh my, lamels work amazing. Like well, lamels, and so offsets, offsets, yeah. every, there's a lot of ways. And even some of the least reputable paramotor brands have honestly figured out a pretty effective oh, absolutely. way. Absolutely, absolutely. So like, it, it, it's just not that hard of a problem to solve. No, I agree. Uh, Lynn Huff says, go best friend. That's my best friend. Hi, honey. <laughs> so I've got my wife at the room tonight. Alex's wife is in the chat. Lynn, great to see you. Uh, we need to talk more about the different flavors of wings that might be able to change your client's life. It's true. That's a hidden a hidden message. Uh, Spencer Owen says, pretty sure the props are breaking the sound barrier on the open BBG. I agree. I'm not sure they actually are, but it's very, very close. If not... Uh, Andrew Finnegan's asked, if the electric PPG is light enough, could you thermal it with a paraglider assist motor? Uh, absolutely. Thermal anything. You can thermal pretty much anything. Uh, that said, one of my pet projects, a uh, project that I'd like to utilize our new electric system, because the electric system is de- developed to be, like the realistic answer for it is that it's developed to be modular. So we could put it on this, we could put it on a fly products, we could put it on whatever. Yeah, the, the, the motor mount is designed to just use the exact same mounting bolts as the Moster. Right. And it spaces it out so that it will match your frame. So honestly, it doesn't matter if you fly Kango, Caparajet, fly products, whatever. If you if your frame will accept a Moster engine. Which then, is the most common, yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Then, then you could buy this and put it on your frame and go fly safely. So my mission for it, which is not at all a marketable mission, um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about thermally in a second, but I want to build one into a pod harness with a collapsible prop. I want to launch here and go get 11 to 1 glide ratio on a whatever wing, Zeno or whatever, and go thermal for a full day just because I want to. Now, much like Pablo earlier said he can't afford to do it, I can't afford to do that either, but I really want to. <laughs> hey, we, we just... I don't know. Always got to be pushing forward, right? <laughs> you got to have a, you got to have a dream. You got to try. Absolutely. Uh, to talk a little bit more about some of the stuff that we're working on, uh, because we've talked a lot about products and development. We've talked about Alex's passion for the sport and for his his ability to come up with a solution for a problem at hand. 
we have seen a massive amount of issues with our own team, with our own students, uh, where we've kind of failed them, where we haven't offered uh, advanced training, intermediate training, things that help them grow themselves. And it's something we've talked about a lot over the last couple of years. And as of today, we actually have scheduled classes. August the 3rd, we have our PBG3 class, which will teach people uh, or ensure their skills. It's not so much teaching as is ensuring skills that they can meet confidence the PBG3. Building. Exactly, meet, meeting PBG3 level uh, stuff. Safe confidence building. Safe is key. And going through the, the written test, uh, August, I can't remember the dates offhand, Nina, maybe you'll help me, uh, for Thermally. August 24th and 25th, we have a Thermaline Clinic. This is a special one to me because I feel like most paramotor pilots, probably yourself included, look at the midday as a no-go. Yeah. The reality is that with the right techniques and acknowledging the risk, midday flying is absolutely incredible um, if you look at the safety aspects very, very carefully and you'll learn the right techniques. I've had an eight-hour flight. I've had five-hour flights. My five-hour flight, I ran the motor for eight minutes. It was Mother's Day. I remember. My wife still wants to murder me. She's right behind (laughs) me. She says it's not true. (laughs) Unless I buy her a microwave. She told me I can't buy her a microwave. I have to buy an airplane first. That is true. That is true. I buy kitchen appliances like they're water. Like... The other day, I was like, oh, we should get a juicer. And I already had one ready to order, and she was like, started clubbing me over the head. <laughs> Three days later, I bought a juicer. It was great. Um, <laughs> so Thermal Clinic, August 24th, uh, October the 5th <laughs> through the 7th, uh, we have another class. This will be a trike transition class. We've had a lot of requests for this. Trikes are awesome. You're this, getting a trike. I am getting a trike. I, I don't know. I think that there is... I think there's a lot of people out there that thinks that think trikes are only for people who that can't, can't foot launch. physically foot launch. Right. And I think that is absolutely ridiculous. I think trikes are awesome. The, the key with a trike, and I, I've told this, people this for about five years uh, when I started flying trike. I, I said that a trike and a speed wing are the ultimate accessories. A speed wing allows you to kite and even fly in much higher wing conditions. And a trike uh, gives you an opportunity to do things that are so like so many more opportunities like like right now my back is killing me right like right now at t6 i have a knife slabbing slamming through my spine it hurts so i wouldn't go put a 60 pound paramotor on and go launch it it, it would be a bad decision but i'll go sit in a trike and launch in a heartbeat and with the foxy trike being 19.8 pounds it doesn't change i can still fly my my free ride 16 right do barrel rolls and loops and it doesn't matter i really should make some videos of this i apologize that we haven't um, but a trike's an incredible accessory, whether it's a physical limitation, condition limitation, uh, and especially on the uh, grounds of, of just not being confident. Like if, you, if you're a I new pilot, I still think you're missing it. You keep using the word limitation. I don't think trikes have to be, be an alternative because you have a limitation. I think they're fun. Can can I high five you really quick? Well, but <laughs> I, the, I think okay. I think that. I think trikes are fun because in certain ways, they're more like an airplane. Right. You can take off and land completely differently. You taxi. It's you really like, fun. It, it's it's a completely different thing. And once, once you get to a certain point of experience with the trike, too. Like, to me, I am extraordinarily passionate about doing things to the maximum possible level that I can pull them off. So, like, when I started flying a trike, I wasn't content with inflate release control posture like go right i wanted to be able to inflate turn 90 degrees take off then inflate turn 180 turn 360 make figure eights i still one of my favorite things is put a wingtip on the ground do a a 360 put the other wingtip on the ground do a three to make figure eights and no wind on the ground because it's really hard yeah it manu showed me how to do that and i watched him do it a whole bunch of times and i'm like well how hard could this be (laughs) Um, it took me 12 tries to be able to do a complete oval, upwind, downwind, crosswind. It uh, much harder than I thought. But uh, I don't know. I, I I think trikes are fun and they completely uh, on their own. I don't think that they need to be associated with any kind of other limitation or anything else. I think that they're just they're a different way to fly um, and have their own benefits and i like them 
I like them too. I fly them frequently. Uh, to answer some questions, we have uh, somebody asking, <clears throat> how much is the Thermaline Clinic? My training is August 10th to 25th, so I just stay longer. All right, so there's not just cost. Uh, each of our clinics for intermediate and advanced pilots is going to have uh, certain requirements for the pilot themselves. Uh, Jason, if you come here and you knock it out of the park in your training and you're the top of your class and you hit the limitations that we're gonna have set, you absolutely may be able to join. I will tell you most likely not uh, due to the amount of natural experience and ability we anticipate you requiring for your safety. So for the PPG-3 class, you have to be a PPG-2 or equivalent with the requisite skills already trained, already practiced, not trained, spot landing, big ears, wing overs. We want you to already have some experience to be able to move to your PPG-3. We're not taking a week to do this, we're taking two days. It's an intensive two days of ground school, of practical experience. With the uh, Thermaline Clinic, we want you to have 50 hours of flight time and be an active pilot with at least a PPG-2 level of certification or equivalency. Uh, with the uh, trike transition, we want you to be an active pilot, someone who already knows how to fly, uh, that has a PPG-2 equivalency, so at least 25 flights, that knows what you're doing, that has some experience. We are not training new pilots on these transition classes. These, these are designed to be transitions, yep. not taking someone who had two days of training two years ago and has flown once since then. We want you to know what you're doing so you can get the most out of it, and so can we. And so all the other students get the most out of it too, so no one is left behind. We want to have students leave here competent and confident, not feeling like they aren't keeping up with everyone else. Uh, the costs are all of them 750 bucks. It's it's less than our daily rent. Oh, I guess it's it's less than our daily instruction rate. It's Sorry, 780. I'm being told because if you if you pay with a credit card at 780, if you bring cash, it's 750. <laughs> um, the, the credit card fees cost money, so uh, yeah, it's 750 bucks for two days of training. 780 if you pay with a credit card. The, the form is on the website right now. You can log in and sign up for those classes. Share your experience. If we feel like you don't have enough experience, we'll decline you until you have that experience. If we fill these classes quickly, we will start scheduling classes for the next few months following October. Uh, we're trying to fit things in with our regular classes and try to make sure that we ensure enough time and attention from instructors to be able to serve your needs. Vertical Lines asked, does PPG 1, 2, and 3 go to towards Sport Pilot? No, sir. I'm sorry. It does not go towards Sport Pilot. In fact, uh, nothing ultralight related goes towards Sport Pilot. By the way, hi, Merrill. Hi, Merrill. I freaking miss Merrill. He is... Good dude. Good dude. Good dude. All right. Guys, it has been a ridiculously long time. We're two hours and 13 minutes into this stream. I've only thrown up once. I was told I would only be on here for 10 minutes. So far, so good? Yep. <laughs> uh, we have, we've shared a lot of stuff with you guys. And normally our streams aren't all about products we're releasing or we have released. But I, I want to put out a, a few awesome things. The EFI is available in the store now for the first time ever. The throttle's available in the store now for the first time ever. Obviously, the strobes are available. The electric unit's coming soon. All Alec, the things. All the things. Uh, Alex and I are always looking for ideas toward other solutions you guys might need, other things you might that might bless your flying. So if there's something yeah. that comes to mind, email me, info at aviatorppg.com. We'd love to share with you. The Spider 3, by the way, for those of you guys who asked, is available in the store right now. We ordered, I think, 40 of them now. I think they're mostly sold, but we should still have one of each color and size. So if you're interested, email us. We'll let you know what's available. Uh, we are super ecstatic, and we're releasing a new Spider 3 video tomorrow that shows some of the most insane slow motion race drone footage around a Spider 3. AJ, who you used to work with. I did. And now works here. Yep. So AJ it was on DRL for many years. He, he's a... a expert race pilot he was number three in the world at one point according to drl standings and he's literally flying his 100 mile an hour race quad through my lines uh of the paraglider which is kind of terrifying can't fix stupid <laughs> are you talking about me or him yeah <laughs> oh my goodness guys thank you all so much for watching oh i forgot we have to give away a power float so we're giving away a power float. This one was chosen at random by Nina. She went through, did the random number generator, I think. I don't know what all she did behind the scenes, but uh, 
We're going to give away a $340 power float, and we're going to keep giving things away every live stream, whether it's t-shirts or strobes or cool stuff, because we really want to inspire you guys to share this stream, to be able to help inspire other people to find flight, to overcome their fears, to do something that will make them better humans. So we have a power float to give away. I have the name. There's so many people saying things now. I'm so excited. It's me. It's not you. Oh. <laughs> do you have a power float? No. Seriously? I I could win one. You know, it's the number one killer in the sport, right? Well, only if you fly over water. You always fly over water. Water is like, it's like magnetic. It's gorgeous. Yep. I told a story last live stream about my brother and I pulling a wonderful guy out of the water who was ready to die, who was tangled up in his lines, didn't put his flotation on because he, and I quote, I'm not going to fly over water. Mm-hmm. Was his name Alex? His name was not Alex, but if you die from flying over water, I'm going to cry. I will. And then you're going to say, I told you so. I will buy you a power. No, Lynn will murder me because she's watching. So your wife will not be okay with this. We'll get you a power float. But you didn't win one. Fine. Who won it, Eric? Ken Thompson. Ken Thompson won the first power float giveaway of 2019. Ken, congratulations, my friend. I don't know how you won. Very nice. Very nice. <laughs> but Nina, Nina uh, has the information. Please email us info at aviatorppg.com or send a message on the Facebook page with your shipping address. We'll get one shipped out to you right away. Congratulations, oh, Ken. By the way, what's the new leading cause of paramotor injury? Oh my gosh, we've almost left this out. The number one cause, the number one cause of injury in paramotor, the entire sport of paramotoring, is right behind me. It is. <laughs> so far, so far in our school, we sold four one wheels, three to instructors. And they, two of the three got hurt? So one of them broke his butthole. The other one hurt his shoulder. Um, in all seriousness, the number one killer in the sport right now, not killer, but the number one injury causing thing is, is the one wheel. And that does not make them any less fun. Nope. <laughs> so if anyone wants a one wheel, email us. We're not one wheel dealers. Uh, this one's actually mine. I, I say that because the one I was using earlier today was covered in sand and I literally like sprayed myself as if it was paint with sand the two times I fell off of it, but it was really fun. So uh, congratulations to Ken. Uh, much love to everyone watching the stream. If, I, I appreciate you bringing this back up because this is the number one cause of injuries in the sport. Anymore, yeah. Number one cause of death is water. Buy a power float, Alex. <laughs> and uh, part this is he's, he's a victim of it all. So guys, we have one wheels in stock. The pints are coming soon. Uh, the rest of it is just a, a fantastic experience. One wheel paramotor launch. Uh, I can do a no hands paramotor launch really easily. I'm pretty scared of doing a one wheel one. Patrick asked how fast they go. Ask AJ. Uh, he, Too fast. He fell off at 18 miles per hour. So uh, I will tell you that uh, that's, that's pretty intense. Michael Swain, if you don't have a, a power float yet, please message me and I will verbally rebuke you and then uh, help you order one. Uh, <laughs> But uh, Ale Jim Furman asks, Alex Huff, engineer a one-wheel training wheel. Now that could make some money. That could make you at least tens of dollars. Yeah, at least. <laughs> maybe, maybe 12. Twelves of dollars? Maybe. Oh, my Lord. All right, guys. It's been a great long live stream. Thanks so much for watching. Sorry for YouTube being down. To everyone who's joined us, it's been a pleasure. We'll see you next week with episode number 15. A bit more of a standard episode. We'll look forward to it every day. It's a joy to have each and every one of you here. See you next week. Have a great night. Thank you, Alex.